President. <laughs> Senator from Iowa. Hey, Mr. President, I ask that further proceedings under the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. And Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that Bill McConaughey, Lindsay Love, Brian Rodriguez, and Tiffany Monrell of my staff be granted four privileges for the duration of today's proceedings. Without objection. Mr. President, after many months of bipartisan negotiation, I have high hopes that the Senate will vote very shortly to invoke cloture on the House message to accompany the Food and Drug Administration Safety and Innovation Act of 2012. I am pleased to report that it is the product of excellent bipartisan collaboration on the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, which I chair, and of productive conversations with our colleagues in the House. The House passed the FDA Safety and Innovation Act unanimously last week, and now it's our turn to do our part. The backbone of this legislation is the user fee agreements that FDA has negotiated with industry. And I might just add, uh, Mr. President, that this bill passed this chamber about three weeks ago on a vote of 96 to 1, so it has strong bipartisan support. A sizable part of FDA's budget comes from user fees that industry agrees to pay to allow FDA to more quickly review product applications. We need to authorize FDA to implement those agreements if we want to keep FDA running at full steam, which is critical to pre preserving jobs at both the agency and in the industry, and to ensuring that FDA has the resources to get safe medical products to patients quickly. I want to be clear, Mr. President, these agreements affect all of us by helping maintain and create jobs in our home states. For example, in my state of Iowa, these agreements will support our burgeoning bioscience sector, which saw employment grow by 4.5 percent between 2007 and 2008. Implementation of these agreements will continue to foster biomedical innovation and job growth in all of our states. The bill before us reauthorizes the prescription drug user fee agreement and the medical device user fee agreement, both commonly known as PADUFA and MADUFA, which will continue and improve the agency's ability to speed market access to prescription drugs and medical devices while ensuring, ensuring patient safety. And again, I just might add that, again, uppermost, foremost, first is patient safety. But that doesn't mean that we can't do things in a better manner, get products more readily available, speed up the process if we have the personnel and the equipment to do so. And that's why this bill is so important. It provides that type of support so that we can hire more people to make sure that we get these products to patients uh, quickly, but to make sure that they are safe. The, uh, the bill also authorizes a new generic drug user fee agreement, uh, which is expected to slash review times to a third of current levels from 30 months to 10 months, drastically uh, improving the speed with which generic products are made available to patients. The new generic user fee agreement will generate significant savings for patients and our health care system. In the last decade alone, from 2001 to 2010, the use of generic drugs saved the U.S. health care system more than $931 billion. This agreement will ensure that we continue to see those savings and that patients have access to cheaper drugs when they need them. This bill also authorizes the new biosimilars user fee agreement, which will further spur innovation by the generic biologic industry. Uh, Mr. Uh, this, this, this chart kind of shows again some of the savings that we will get from this. The use of generic drugs has saved over $931 billion in the last decade, $158 billion just in 2010 alone. So we can see that the, uh, the better able that we're able, the better we are able to get generic drugs approved and in the pipeline, again safely, uh, the better off we're all going to be and more money that not only will we save as individuals but our entire health care system uh, will save. Uh, that's almost a trillion dollars over, over, the, over just the last 10 years. Now, these agreements, again, as I say, are vital to FDA's ability to do its job, vital to the stability of the medical products industry, and most importantly to the patients who are the primary beneficiaries of this long-standing and valuable collaboration between FDA and the industry. 
After months of negotiation, FDA and the industry have crafted win-win agreements that they stand behind. They've done their job. Now it's time for us to do ours. Mr. President, it's absolutely imperative that we authorize these user fee agreements before they expire. If we don't, FDA will lose 60 percent of its drug center budget and 20 percent of its device center budget. It will have to lay off nearly 2,000 employees. And that's why it's so critical for us to do this at this time. Now, to be sure, uh, the, 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 the expiration doesn't happen until late this summer. But FDA has told us that if they don't get this reauthorization done, they will have to start sending out pink slips at the beginning of July. So that's why it's so imperative for us to pass this this week uh, and send it to the President for his signature so that they will not have to go through that process of sending out pink slips. But you can see how important this is. If, if this were to happen, uh, it would have devastating consequences for patients whose health and lives depend on new medical treatments. We can't let that happen, and that's why for more than a year I worked closely with my colleague, ranking member of the Health Committee, Senator Enzi, and other members of the Health Committee. Our aim has been to ensure that in addition to the user fee agreements, the other provisions in this legislation are also the product of consensus bipartisan policy making. We have used bipartisan working groups and an open, transparent process to ensure that we had input from our members and the stakeholder community at large throughout negotiations on the other titles of this bill. This is quite remarkable, Mr. President. We don't see much of it in this Congress these days. But we've had great, great cooperation from all members of our committee on both sides of the aisle. This legislation has benefited greatly from all of the di diverse input from senators, as I said, on both sides of the aisle, industry stakeholders, consumer groups, patient groups more recently from our colleagues in the House. The FDA Safety and Innovation Act is a result of concerted efforts to define our common interests. And these efforts will directly benefit patients and the U.S. biomedical industry. As you can see from this chart, the bill modernizes FDA authority in several critical ways. It authorizes key user fee agreements to ensure timely approval of medical products. It streamlines the device approval process it modernizes FDA's global drug supply chain authority. Again, that's so important. It spurs innovation and incentivizes drug development for life-threatening conditions. It reauthorizes and improves incentives for pediatric uh, trials, pediatric uh, health care. It helps prevent and mitigate drug shortages, and it increases FDA's accountability and transparency. So it uh, addresses a broad array of critical issues that we face in today's global economy. And it's imperative that our regulatory system keeps pace with and adapts to technological and scientific advances and that patient protections remain strong in this era of dynamic change. Keeping pace with the ever-changing biomedical landscape is precisely the aim of the FDA Safety and Innovation Act. This bill injects greater transparency into the device approval process. It bolsters FDA's ability to help U.S. manufacturers create innovative and safe devices, while also enhancing FDA's ability to determine how devices perform in the real world and to take appropriate measures to protect patients. The bill also reauthorizes and improves incentives, as I said, for pediatric trials. It creates incentives for the development of new antibiotics. It authorizes new drug and device provisions to help expedite the approval of important life-saving drugs and devices, again, without sacrificing safety. In addition, the bill also helps address the national crisis of the of prescription drug shortages. For the past several years, hospitals across the country and in my home state of Iowa have experienced an increasing number of shortages of life-sustaining prescription drugs. These shortages directly threaten the public health by denying patients access to medications that are indispensable to their care. This bill requires all manufacturers of certain drugs to notify FDA if, if they expect a manufacturing disruption that could lead to a shortage. Because if FDA is aware of a potential shortage early, then the agency can work with manufacturers and other providers to find other ways to get patients the drugs that they need. This bill also addresses drug shortages by explicitly allowing FDA to expedite drug establishment inspections and application reviews 
when needed to help prevent or mitigate a shortage. It establishes an FDA drug shortage task force to develop a strategic plan to address drug, shor drug shortages and to improve communication and outreach to stakeholders preparing for drug shortages. Another significant advance in the FDA bill is the much needed modernization of their authority to ensure the safety of drug products coming into the U.S. from abroad. This bill, number one, allows FDA to prioritize inspections of both domestic and foreign firms based on the risk that they, uh, that they uh, present to patient safety. It requires importers to demonstrate that certain high-risk drugs are safe and compliant before they can be imported in the United States. It requires manufacturer accountability and oversight of the quality and compliance of their drug producers and suppliers. It enhances penalties for adulterating and counterfeiting drugs. It allows FDA to detain non-compliant drugs in U.S. commerce to prevent them from reaching patients. It permits FDA to destroy certain illegal drugs at the border instead of releasing them back into commerce. And it clarifies FDA's authority to address criminal conduct that occurs abroad and threatens the safety of U.S. consumers. An important point to remember about the importance of these safety provisions is that weaknesses in our pharmaceutical supply chain not only affect the health of American patients, they also affect the health of American businesses. U.S. companies that source and manufacture drugs in this country should not be placed at a competitive disadvantage by foreign firms that operate with less oversight and sell substandard ingredients into this country at reduced prices. This bill will help ensure that businesses operate on a level playing field by holding foreign actors to the same high standards as those in the U.S. Now, the last policy provision I'll highlight is a mix of device and drug authorities that together can fairly be described as the most significant advance for patients of orphan and rare diseases since the Orphan Drug Act was passed nearly 30 years ago. In addition to the significant resources that will be devoted to rare diseases under the Prescription Drug User Fee Agreement itself, this bill, number one, expands the accelerated approval pathway to therapies for rare and very rare diseases uh, and instructs FDA to weigh the rarity of a disease as a factor in its approval process. Uh, next, it directs resources to promising therapies for unmet medical needs, which will receive the new breakthrough designation. Next, it requires FDA to consult with outside experts on rare diseases. Next, it focuses on pediatric rare diseases by requiring a strategic plan regarding pediatric rare diseases and creating a pilot program to incentivize new therapies for pediatric rare diseases. Next, it helps make devices for rare diseases more available by modernizing provisions relating to custom devices and making it easier for companies to make profits on devices for rare diseases. And lastly, it reforms the conflict of interest rules for advisory committees to make it easier for the FDA to fill panels which will have particular impact regarding rare diseases because those panels sometimes are very hard to fill. So I'm very proud of the advances legislation will represent for patients with orphan and rare diseases. And not only does this bill support the biomedical industry and help patients get the medical products they need, it also reduces the deficit. According to the Congressional Budget Office, this legislation would reduce the budget deficit by more than $311 million in the next decade. So what we have here is not only good policy, but it's fiscally responsible, contributing to deficit reduction. Mr. President, as I have said, well over a year of diligent bipartisan work has gone into the legislation before us today. Now the Democrats nor Republicans got everything they wanted in this bill. We sought out consensus measures, and where we could not achieve consensus, we did not allow our differences to distract us from the critically important goal of producing a bill that everyone could support. As a result, this is a true bipartisan bill, and it is broadly supported by the patients, groups, and industry. In fact, uh, it has huge, wide support from both uh, medical associations, uh, but also from consumers groups uh, and also manufacturers uh, throughout, the, throughout the entire country. Broad base of support. In fact, it's, it's unique because it does. It has the full support of manufacturers, of the pharmaceutical industry, device manufacturers, 
um, of the FDA itself, and uh, patients groups, people who are concerned about patient safety, cost, and availability of drugs and devices. So it has a broad base of support. The FDA Safety and Innovation Act before us that we'll be voting on in just a little while authorizes the important FDA user fee agreements. It modernizes our regulatory system to ensure safety and to foster innovation in the medical product industry. Our bipartisan work has produced an excellent bill. We cannot allow unrelated, I repeat unrelated, partisan disagreements or presidential election year politics to interfere or to keep us from completing our job. I will say it again, we must pass this vital legislation now. It is critically important to the agency, to the industry, and most importantly, to the patients that we get this done. So let us come together to pass this legislation. Let's have a resounding vote on cloture. Hopefully we won't have to use up the 30 hours and we can get to passage of this bill uh, very rapidly so that we can get it down to the President for his signature. Mr. President, with that, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Utah. Mr. President, I rise today to express my support for the Minority Leader's decision to invoke the long-standing Senate tradition known as the Leahy Thurmond Rule. Pursuant to this tradition and this precedent, the Senate will cease confirming nominees to the Federal Courts of Appeals until after the presidential election in November. Many of my colleagues from the other side of the aisle have previously affirmed the propriety of this rule and enforced its standard. For example, in the last year of the Bush administration, the majority leader noted that, quote, in a presidential election year, it is always very tough for judges. That is the way it has been for a long time, and that is why we have the Thurmond Rule, close quote. The chairman of the Judiciary Committee, who has cited the Thurmond Rule more frequently than any other senator, has likewise stated that, quote, in a presidential election year, after spring, no judges go through except by the consent of the Republican and Democratic leader, close quote. Statements from several of my Democratic colleagues likewise confirm that it is proper to invoke the Leahy Thurmond rule at this point in a presidential election year. In 2008, for example, one of my colleagues on the Judiciary Committee argued that for federal appeals court nominees, once it comes to June, generally everything stops in an election year. Indeed, on June 12th of that same year, another Judiciary Committee colleague stated that the Senate was, quote, way past the time of the Thurmond Rule, close quote. Now history, Mr. President, further confirms the propriety of invoking the Leahy Thurmond Rule at this time. It is extremely rare for the Senate to confirm an appeals court nominee after June of a presidential election year. In fact, it has happened only once in almost two decades when in 2000 the Republican-controlled Senate confirmed one of President Clinton's nominees. It is simply not true, as comments from some of my colleagues has, have implied, that in recent presidential election years, we have confirmed appellate court nominees in July, August, or September. Moreover, this year, we have already confirmed five of President Obama's federal appeals court nominees. This, incidentally, is the same number of appeals court nominees that the Senate confirmed in 2008 the most recent presidential election year on record. And in 2004, the Senate confirmed only four such nominees. Indeed, dating back over 100 years, from President William Howard Taft to President Obama, the Senate has confirmed an average of just four appeals court nominees during presidential election years. This year, we've already exceeded the historical average and confirmed five of President Obama's appeals court nominees. There is no reason to depart further from the historical norm and confirm additional nominees. The suggestion by some that application of the Leahy Thurmond rule somehow affects court vacancies deemed judicial emergencies are false and indeed recklessly so. Of the four judicial emergencies on the federal courts of appeals, President Obama has nominated only one individual 
And because that nomination was so recent, even absent the Leahy Thurmond rule, that nominee would not be scheduled for a vote anytime soon. I would also remind my colleagues that Democrats enforced the Leahy Thurmond rule in June 2008 during a time when there were twice as many judicial emergencies in the circuit courts as there are right now. Likewise, the overall vacancy rate on our circuit courts was much higher in June 2004 when President, when President Bush was in the final year of his term, yet Democrats did not hesitate to block several qualified appellate court nominees in the months leading up to the 2004 presidential election. Enforcement of the Leahy Thurmond rule does not currently apply to, judicial, uh, for, to district court nominees. This year, the Senate has already confirmed 23 of President Obama's district court nominees, many more than were confirmed during comparable years during the Bush presidency or the Clinton presidency. And we will continue to confirm more qualified nominees. Application of the Leahy Thurmond rule beginning now will thus not implicate any district court judicial emergencies. The urgency for such vacancies lies not in the Senate, which to this day has acted responsibly on um, nominees, but with President Obama, who to this day has failed to nominate individuals for many of these seats. There are, I would add, other good reasons, in addition to the tradition and the historical precedent, to enforce the Leahy Thurmond rule now, rather than waiting longer to do so. Doing so now prevents a particular president from packing the courts at the end of his term by appointing influential, life-tenured appellate court judges whose service will span numerous other presidential administrations. The Leahy Thurmond rule also ensures that presidential politics during an election season will not overshadow or interfere with the Senate's advice and consent rule on such judicial nominees. The last point bears special emphasis. The Constitution assigns to the Senate the right and the duty to consent to the President's judicial and executive branch nominees. It is essential for the Constitution's separation of powers that the Senate protect its necessary and legitimate role in the nominations process against encroachment by the executive branch of government. Earlier this year, we witnessed a troubling demonstration of what can happen when the President violates the Constitution's separation of powers and tramples on the Senate's rightful prerogatives in the advice and consent process. On January 4, 2012, at a time when the Senate was conducting brief sessions approximately every 72 hours, President Obama nonetheless bypassed the Senate and unilaterally appointed four significant executive branch nominees. By asserting the power to make recess appointments, even when the Senate, according to its own rules, was not in recess, the President simply ignored the Senate's legitimate constitutional right to advise and consent to nominees made by the President. President Obama's unconstitutional appointments cut to the very heart of our Constitution's separation of powers and the institutional prerogatives that rightfully belong right here in this body. Accordingly, since the time of those appointments, I've sought to protect the Senate's interests by opposing President Obama's judicial nominees. I've made clear that I would do the same were a Republican president to make similarly unconstitutional appointments under the Recess Appointments Clause. As the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee noted at a recent Judiciary Committee hearing, I've stated my concern with President Obama's unconstitutional recess appointments very clearly, but I have also been, in his words, extremely responsible in my opposition and have not hindered the work of the Senate. In light of President Obama's unconstitutional appointments, it is all the more proper that we invoke the Leahy Thurmond rule now. I agree with the ranking member of the Senate Judiciary Committee that we should have invoked that rule back in January at the time of the unconstitutional appointments. By enforcing the Leahy Thurmond rule now, we will demonstrate for the historical record that the Senate did not acquiesce 
in President Obama's unconstitutional recess appointments. And instead, we took action to protect the Senate's institutional prerogatives. When we have done so, I will again be in a position to vote in favor of qualified, consensus district court nominees. But I will always remain vigilant in seeking to protect the Senate against unconstitutional encroachment by the executive branch. As members of this body, we have an institutional responsibility to safeguard the Senate's essential advice and consent role and to confirm only those nominees who are properly qualified to serve in the positions for which they have been rightfully nominated. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask consent to speak in morning business. Without objection. Mr. President, today the United States Supreme Court announced its decision on SB 1070, the controversial Arizona immigration law. The court, including conservative justices Anthony Kennedy and John Roberts, agreed with the Obama administration that a state cannot set up its own immigration enforcement system. As a result, the Supreme Court today struck down several parts of the Arizona law, including the provision that would have made it a crime in Arizona to be an undocumented immigrant, and the provision that would have required legal immigrants to carry documents proving their legal status at all times. The Supreme Court is right. States do not have the right under the Constitution to enact immigration laws that contradict federal law. Many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle strongly criticized the Obama administration for even challenging the Arizona immigration law. There was even an amendment offered to try to block the Justice Department from pursuing the litigation that was brought to the Supreme Court. Fortunately, the vast majority of Democrats, joined by two Republicans, Senators Johans and Voinovich, blocked that amendment. Now the Supreme Court, including Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kennedy, has sided with the Obama administration in holding the vast majority of the Arizona law unconstitutional. I am troubled that the Supreme Court upheld one of the provisions in that law in Arizona, Section 2B, which requires Arizona police officers to check the immigration status of suspected undocumented immigrants. But it's important to understand that court decision on that section is a narrow one. The only question before the court was whether that section 2B was preempted by federal immigration law. The court said it is open to future challenges once the law goes into effect and this provision may still be held unconstitutional like the other provisions in the Arizona law. Now according to law enforcement experts, section 2B is likely to encourage profiling which would violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. Specifically, Section 2B requires police officers to check the immigration status of any individual with whom they have lawful contact if they have, quote, reasonable suspicion that the person is an undocumented immigrant. So what's the basis for reasonable suspicion that the person they pulled over is, in fact, an undocumented immigrant? Well. The guidance on the law issued in the state of Arizona says that police officers should consider things such as how a person is dressed or their ability to communicate in English. Earlier this year, I held a hearing on racial profiling in my subcommittee, the Judiciary Committee on Constitution, Civil Rights, and Human Rights. It was the first hearing on racial profiling since before 9-11. <clears throat> One of the witnesses at my hearing was Ron Davis. He's the chief of police in East Palo Alto, California. Chief Davis, along with 16 other law enforcement officials and the major city's chiefs of police association, filed a brief in the Arizona case. In their brief, the police chiefs say, and I quote, the statutory standard of reasonable suspicion of unlawful presence in the United States will, as a practical matter, produce a focus on minorities and specifically Latinos, end of quote. Two former Arizona attorneys general, joined by 42 other former state attorneys general, filed an amicus brief in the Arizona case, and they said, I quote, application of the law in Arizona requires racial profiling, end of quote. I agree with these law enforcement experts. I'm confident that Section 2B will eventually be struck down as the other provisions were in the Arizona law. 
Arizona law is the wrong approach for America. It is amazing to me how this nation of immigrants, of which we are all part of the family, has struggled for so long to deal with the, uh, the whole issue of immigration. I think it is wrong to treat people like criminals simply because of their immigration status. And it's not right to make criminals of people who literally go to work every day cooking our food, cleaning our rooms, and caring in nursing homes for our children, daycare centers for our children, and nursing homes for our parents and grandparents. Here's the reality. Treating immigrants like criminals will not help combat illegal immigration. Law enforcement doesn't have the time or the resources to prosecute and incarcerate every undocumented immigrant among the 10 or 11 million in this country. Making undocumented immigrants into criminals simply drives them into the shadows. That's why the Arizona Association of Chiefs of Police opposes the Arizona law considered by the court today. They say it'll make it more difficult for them to make Arizona a safe place. Immigrants are less likely to cooperate with the police if they fear they're going to get arrested for even trying to help. Instead of measures that harm law enforcement and promote racial profiling, like the Arizona immigration law, we need practical solutions to fix a broken immigration system. That case was before the Supreme Court. The court made its decision today because this body, the Senate, and the House have failed to accept their responsibility. We have a responsibility, if in fact immigration is a federal issue, for a federal response, and we failed. Now the first step we should take in passing comprehensive immigration reform is to pass the DREAM Act, legislation that would allow a select group of immigrant students who grew up in this country to earn citizenship, either by attending college or serving in the military. Russell Pierce is the author of the Arizona Immigration Law. He had this to say about the DREAM Act, and I quote, the DREAM Act is one of the greatest legislative threats to America's sovereignty, national security, and economic future, end of quote. Well, I see it differently and so do many others, including General Colin Powell and former Defense Secretary Robert Gates. They support the DREAM Act because it would make America a stronger country by giving these talented immigrants the chance to serve in the military and contribute to the future of America. The best way to understand the problems with the Arizona immigration law and the need for the DREAM Act and comprehensive immigration law is to hear the stories of some of the immigrant students who would be eligible for the DREAM Act. They call themselves dreamers. Almost every week in the session, I come to the floor of the Senate to tell the story of one of these young people. Over the years, I've told stories of several dreamers from the state of Arizona. Under the Arizona law, these young people would be targets for prosecution and incarceration. Under the DREAM Act, they would be future citizens who could make America and Arizona stronger. Today, I want to introduce one of them to you from Arizona. Her name is Angelica Hernandez. She was brought to Phoenix, Arizona when she was nine years old. She started school in the fourth grade. By the time she reached the sixth grade, Angelica no longer took English as a second language. She was proficient in the language of English. At Carl Hayden High School in Phoenix, Arizona, Angelica served in junior ROTC and was president of the National Honor Society. She became a dedicated member of the school's robotics club where she found her true love, engineering. Angelica graduated from high school with a 4.5 GPA in 2007 and was named Outstanding Young Woman of the Year for District 7 in Phoenix. Last year, Angelica Hernandez graduated from Arizona State University. You can see her holding her graduation certificate here as the outstanding senior in the mechanical engineering department with a 4.1 GPA. Under the Arizona immigration law, Angelica Hernandez would be a target for prosecution and incarceration. Under the DREAM Act, she would be a future citizen and engineer who could contribute her talents to making this a better country. What a choice to take this woman who has spent virtually her entire life, as she remembers it, in America, attending our schools, excelling in those schools, being acknowledged as one of the better students, 
Her ambition takes her to a great university, Arizona State University, where she graduates at the top of her class in mechanical engineering, and some would say now is the perfect time to tell her to leave America. I think they're wrong. Angelica Hernandez and people like her will make this a better country. Unlike the Arizona immigration law, the DREAM Act is a practical solution to a broken immigration system. The Arizona law would harm law enforcement and encourage profiling. The DREAM Act would make America stronger. Now, President Obama understands this. That's why he challenged the Arizona law, taking the case to the Supreme Court. And that's why earlier this month, I salute the President for announcing his administration will no longer deport people just like Angelica Hernandez, who would be eligible for the DREAM Act. I strongly support President Obama's courage and his decision. It is one of the most historic humanitarian moments of our time. His decision will give these young immigrants the chance to finally come out of the shadows and be part of the only country they've ever called home. It was the right thing to do. These students didn't make the decision to come to this country. Angelica was brought here at the age of nine. And it is not the American way to punish children for the wrongdoing of their parents. President Obama's new deportation policy will make America better by giving these talented immigrants the chance to contribute. Studies have found that DREAM Act students will literally boost the American economy during their working lives. This policy is also clearly legal. Throughout our history, the government has decided who to prosecute and who not to prosecute based on law enforcement priorities and available resources. Past administrations of both political parties have used their authority to stop deportation of low priority cases. The courts have recognized that. Listen to what the Supreme Court said today in the Arizona immigration law case. A princi principal feature of the removal system is the broad discretion exercised by immigration officials. Discretion in the enforcement of immigration law embraces immediate human concerns. End of quote. The President's plan is smart and realistic. The Department of Homeland Security has to set priorities. It's not amnesty, simply a decision to focus limited government resources on those who have committed serious crimes and are a threat to public safety, not the DREAM Act students. Compare President Obama's approach with the presidential candidate from another party. He said the Arizona law was a, quote, model, close quote, for the rest of America. That other presidential party candidate has promised if he is elected president, he will veto the DREAM Act, and he's refused to say whether he would even maintain or rescind President Obama's uh, order banning the deportation of DREAM Act students. That's a wrong approach for America. The administration's new policy on the DREAM Act is only temporary. I understand that. The burden is still on us in the Senate and the House to do something about the many thousands of students across America, just like this dynamic young lady in Arizona, who simply want a chance to be part of America and its future. Our first step, pass the DREAM Act. Do it and do it now. Justice Kennedy wrote in his opinion today, the history of the United States is in part made of the stories, talents, and lasting contributions of those who crossed oceans and deserts to come here. End of quote. Justice Kennedy's right. Congress should reform our immigration laws so we can once again welcome those who cross the oceans and deserts to revitalize and strengthen this nation of immigrants. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Senator from Arizona. Mr. President, I came to the floor to discuss another issue, but since my friend from Illinois, who I share many of his comments uh, about, I have to comment. Uh, the fact is that the irony of the Supreme Court decision today is that the Supreme Court said that it is a federal responsibility to ensure our borders and not one of the states, uh, not the state's responsibility. The irony of all this is that the state of Arizona acted because the federal government wouldn't act, because our borders were broken, because the people in the southern part of our state were living in fear that a rancher was killed by someone who had crossed our border illegally, that the flow of drugs guided by people on mountaintops today, guiding drug runners across our border in Arizona, following up to Phoenix, where drugs, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, where drugs are distributed all over this nation. Uh, $887 million was wasted in a contract for a, quote, virtual fence. Coyotes 
who bring these people across, who treat them in the most abominable fashion, where they're taken up and put into drop houses, where they're kept in the worst kinds of conditions and held for ransom, because the federal government would not secure our borders, then the state of Arizona felt they had to act because people in the southern part of our state and even other parts of our state were living in fear. They were living in fear because of the drug dealers who were coming across, because of the coyotes and the mistreatment of the people that they were bringing. Of course, we want to address the issue of children who were born here. But we also have an obligation to have our border secured. I repeat today, I say to my friend from Illinois, there are people sitting on mountaintops hired by the drug cartels that are guiding the drug runners across our border up to Phoenix, and you can ask the DEA, and these drugs are distributed throughout the country from Phoenix, Arizona. People are killed, people are murdered. The violence on the other side of the border threatens every day from spilling over to our side of the border. And so I hope as a result of this decision that the administration will get serious about actually securing our border. And everyone, every uh, one agrees, every expert agrees, that because of the work that's been done in California and Texas, that it is funneled up through the state of Arizona. And have there been improvements? Of course there have been improvements. Is it still going on? As long as you've got guys sitting on mountaintops guiding drug dealers all the way up to Phoenix, Arizona, we haven't got a secure border. And that's what the people of Arizona not only want, but they also deserve. I will go into the DREAM Act and, and the fact that we do, and by the way, Mitt Romney agrees that we have to address this issue in a comprehensive fashion, as well as concern about the plight of the children who are brought here illegally. But I would also point out to my friend that part of the DREAM Act as proposed by the Center from Illinois is two years service in the military. We don't, we don't sign people up for two years. We sign them up for four years. That's just one area that, that uh, well, we sign up a few. But average citizens, in order to get a path to a green card and a path to citizenship, sign up for four years. That's just one of the areas that needs to be worked out. So, uh, there'll be a lot of conversation about this, but I believe that people who live inside of our country, no matter whether it be in Arizona or Illinois, deserve the right to live in a safe environment. And the people who live in the southern part of our state do not have uh, that right. And, and I hope that we can get our border secure, we can move forward with comprehensive immigration, which, by the way, the then Senator Obama was one of the key reasons why it failed, because he wanted to sunset the, uh, the uh, guest worker program, and that's a fact, you can look it up, I say to my friend from Illinois. Although it was killed by people on this side, it was also a broken promise on the part of then Senator Obama, who said that he wouldn't vote for an amendment. He assured Senator Kennedy and me that he wouldn't vote for an amendment that would impair the progress of comprehensive reform at that time. Mr. President, I want to change the subject now. I look forward to having further discussions with the Senator from Illinois as we will move forward sooner or later with comprehensive immigration reform, which is absolutely needed, and I look forward to engaging in that again, but we also have to ensure the security of all of our citizens and, and stop the flow of drugs across our southern border, which is killing our young Americans. And by the way, I'd say to the senator from Illinois, the price of an ounce of cocaine in the street in Chicago today is not one less penny higher than it was 10 years ago, which means that we are not restricting the flow of drugs coming into our country. As we all know, the majority of it comes across from our, across our southern border, the majority of it. Mr. President, later this week, the Supreme Court will issue a ruling on the health care bill designed and inaugurated and negotiated by the White House. I, I forgot one other thing. The, the, then Senator Obama, I would remind my friend from Illinois, promised in th the campaign of 2008 that immigration reform would be his first priority. The senator had 60 votes over here at an overwhelming majority in the House of Representatives in the first two years of the Obama administration, I never saw a proposal come to the United States Senate for comprehensive immigration reform. Now, the DREAM Act did. Comprehensive immigration reform? No. That's what then Senator Obama promised. Go ahead, please. I, I would just say... Mr. President, uh, I, I yield 
I ask unanimous consent for a colloquy between myself and the Senator from Illinois. Let, let me say, uh, Senator from Arizona is my friend, and there are many things we've worked on together. I respect him very much. And uh, he knows, as I do, that when the DREAM Act was called, the first part, we thought the introductory, maybe the easiest part of immigration reform, it was stopped by a Republican filibuster. Republican filibuster. But and we couldn't come point. up with 60 I, I, votes. I don't dispute that point, I say to my friend from Illinois. There was no comprehensive immigration reform proposal that came over from the White House or from the Democrats, as was promised by then Senator Obama when running for the presidency. That's a fact. I would say to the Senator from Arizona, as part of this colloquy, we thought that would be the first step. We couldn't get past the first step because of Republican filibuster. Well, I wish that then maybe then President Obama or Senator Obama, when running for president, said, but first I'm coming over with the DREAM Act. He didn't. He said, my first act will be comprehensive immigration reform. I was invited over to the White House in 2009. We talked about comprehensive immigration reform. I said, I will await a proposal from the administration on comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, my phone never rang. I say to the Senator from Arizona, perhaps the day will come in our lifetime when we can see that and you and I can work on it together again as we once did before. I would look forward to that. I look forward to it and I want to say there has been no more passionate advocate in the United States Senate than the Senator from Illinois. I respect him and admire him for his compassion and his concern about young people whose lives, as he very well described, need to have some kind of assurance for their future since it's clearly a compelling humanitarian situation. I thank my friend from Illinois for it. Mr. President, later this week the Supreme Court will issue its ruling on the health care bill designed and negotiated by the White House and rammed through Congress during President Obama's first year in office when the economy was near its weakest. Instead of focusing on recovery and persistent unemployment, the President and the majority is controlling Congress squandered the opportunity and forced the unpopular and potentially unconstitutional legislation on the American people. Today we're going to vote on final passage of the reconciled FDA user fee bill. During Senate consideration of this bill, I offered an amendment to allow safe drug importation from legitimate Canadian pharmacies, but the pharmaceutical industry spread misleading and in inaccurate information about the amendment, as they have done time and time again. As I said then, there is no greater example of the influence of special interests on this body than the failure to enact an amendment that would have allowed from Canadian pharmacies, or legitimate pharmacies, that people could purchase their much-needed medication at sometimes half the cost of what it is in the United States of America. And I'm embarrassed to this day that nine of my Republican colleagues also voted against it. The pharma now, I don't know if there was a sweetheart deal to protect pharma at the expense of American patients from the vote on my amendment. But we do know that pharma was protected by the White House and Senate Democrats from provisions they didn't like in Obamacare only after they offered up advertising exchange for more accommodating policies. From a recent House Energy and Commerce Committee investigation, it is now confirmed that Pharma orchestrated a grand deal with the White House and Senate Democrats to oppose importation and other policies. I might point out, then-Senator Obama supported drug importation. And this, my friends, is what happened. This is how the New York Times described the scenario uh, as the, the deal that was done in exchange for reportedly $150 million in advertising to support Obamacare. This is from the New York Times. They described the scenario. June 8, 2012. After weeks of quiet talks, drug industry lobbyists were growing nervous. If they were to cut a deal with the White House on overhauling health care, they needed to be sure President Obama would stop a proposal by his liberal allies intended to bring down medicine prices. On June 3, 2009, one of the lobbyists emailed Nancy Ann DeParley, the President's top health care advisor. Ms. DeParle sent a message back reassuring the lobbyists. Although Mr. Obama was overseas, she wrote, she and other top officials, quote, made decision based on how constructive you guys have been to oppose importation on the bill, unquote. Just like that, Mr. Obama's staff abandoned his support for the reimportation of prescription drug medicines at lower prices, 
and with it solidified a growing compact with an industry he had vilified on the campaign trail the year before. A president who had once promised to air negotiations on C-SPAN cut a closed-door deal with a powerful pharmaceutical lobby, signifying to some disillusioned liberal supporters a loss of innocence or perhaps even the triumph of cynicism. Still, what distinguishes the Obama industry deal is that he had so strongly rejected that very sort of business as usual. Ironically, candidate Obama sang a very different tune on the campaign trail in 2008. Quote, you know, I don't want to learn how to play the game better. I want to put an end to the game playing. The New York Times article continued. The emails which the House Committee obtained from Pharma and other groups, my friends, Pharma is a lobbying group for the pharmaceutical industry, document a tumultuous negotiation at times transactional. Quote, and I continue to quote from the New York Times article, in the end, the White House got the support it needed to pass its broader priority, but industry emerged satisfied as well. Quote, we got a deal, unquote, wrote Bryant Hall, then senior vice president of the pharmaceutical group. In July, the White House made clear it wanted supportive ads using the same characters the industry used to defeat Mr. Clinton's proposal 15 years earlier. Quote, Rahm asked for Harry and Louise ads through third party, Mr. Hall wrote. Talks came close to breaking down several times. In May, the White House was upset that the industry had not signed on to a joint statement. One industry official wrote that they should sign, quote, Rahm is already furious. The ire will be turned on us. The emails also detail extensive and direct negotiations with pharma, its drug company members, the American Medical Association, AARP, the American Hospital Association, unions, and many more. Members of the Alliance all participated because they thought they were getting something more valuable, revenue to their organization or membership, because the federal government was going to force everyone into some form of government-designed health insurance coverage than what they were going to have to spend on advertising to support the legislation. Some reports have the pharma advertising commitment as high as $150 million spread out through direct advertising in certain important states and among groups created to sound like they were looking out for patients or to tout the economic benefits of Obamacare. On June 11, 2012, the Wall Street Journal described the emails about the 2009 negotiations. The joint venture was, for, was forged in secret in spring of 2009 amid an uneasy mix of menace and opportunism. The drug makers worried that health care reform would revert to the liberal default of price controls and drug reimportation that Mr. Obama campaigned on, but they also understood that a new entitlement could be a windfall as taxpayers bought more of their products. Initially, the Obama tiers and Senate Finance Chairman Max Baucus asked for $100 billion, 90% of it from mandatory rebates through the Medicare prescription drug benefit like those that are imposed in Medicaid. The drug makers wheeled them down to $80 billion by offsetting cost sharing for seniors on Medicare in an explicit prid quo quo for protection against such rebates and reimportation. Terms were reached in June. Lead pharma negotiator Brian Hall wrote on Ju June 12th that, quote, Mr. Obama, quote, knows personally about our deal and is pushing no agenda. But Energy and Commerce Chairman Henry Waxman then announced that he was pocketing pharma's concessions and demanding more, including reimportation. We wrote about the double cross in a July 16, 2019 called Big Pharma Gets Played, unquote noting that Mr. Tozen's corporate clients and their shareholders may soon pay for his attempt to get cozy with Obamacare. Mr. Hall forwarded the piece to Mrs. DeParley with the subject line, quote, this sucks, unquote. The White House wrote to the rescue. In September, Mr. Hall informed Mr. Kendler that Deputy White House Chief of Staff Jim Messina is working on some very explicit language on importation to kill it in health care reform. This has to say, stay quiet. Pharma more than paid for the favor with a $150 million advertising campaign coordinated with the White House political shop, as one of Mr. Hall's deputies put it earlier in the minutes of a meeting when the deal was being negotiated, 
the WH designated folks would like us to start to define what consensus health care reform means and what it might include. They definitely want us in the game and on the same side. In particular, the drug lobby would spend $70 million on two 501c4 front groups called Healthy Economy Now and Americans for Stable Quality Care. In July, Mr. Hall wrote that, quote, Rahm asked for Harry and Louise ads through third party. We've already contacted the agent. Mr. President, the uh, my statement goes on, goes on and on. It's a, it's a case of the worst kind of deal making behind closed doors, non-transparent, getting uh, special interest, the, their, uh, their objectives at, at achieved at the expense of the American people. Mr. President, the White House owes us an explanation. We need to know why Mr. Axelrod's old firm was hired to run the ads promoting Obamacare. At the time, a, 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 a organization spokesman said that, but the email suggests otherwise. And email after email, the contributors refer to four men as the, quote, White House team running health care. In one email, pharma consultant Steve McMahon calls these four the White House designated folks. He explains to colleagues that Messrs. Grossman, Grislano, and Delcato are very close to Axelrod. They've been put in charge of the campaign to pass health care reform. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to put in the record a New York Times article, June 8, 2012, Wall Street Journal article, <coughs> 2000 and, uh, June 11, 2012, and June 21st, Wall Street Journal editorial, and the memos about the emails that are associated with this report. Without objection. Mr. President, I, I know that my other colleagues are waiting to speak, but uh, last month when we uh, voted down this uh, amendment to allow drug reimportation from pharmacies that are accredited by both the Canadian and American government, my statement was, and I'll repeat it, in a normal world, this would probably require, require a voice vote. But what we're about to see is the incredible influence of the special interests, particularly pharma, here in Washington. So what you're about to see, as I predicted just before the vote, is the reason for the cynicism of the American people have about the way we do business in Washington. Pharma, one of the most powerful lobbies in Washington, will exert its influence again at the expense of average low-income Americans who will again have to choose between medication and eating. And in response, the senator from New Jersey said, in opposition to my amendment, he said, it's not the special interests that have caused the Senate countless times to reject this policy. This is about the health and security of the American people. That's why time after time the Senate has rejected it. It's why it should be rejected again. And he was correct. It was rejected. The American people were rejected in favor of one of the most powerful special interest lobby in Washington, and it is a shame. Mr. President, I suggest the absence of a quorum. Mr. Kukul, call the roll. Mr. Okonkwo. And the Senate in a quorum call now. They have been debating a bill that would continue federal flood insurance program and some other issues. 
at about 5.30, in about 25 minutes, a vote is scheduled to move forward on an FDA user fee. That user fee lets the agency collect fees to pay for its approval process on prescription drugs and medical devices. And the House, on the other side of the Capitol, not in legislative session today. They were in for a brief pro forma session, and they'll be back in for legislative business tomorrow. Tonight, I'll let you know a discussion about Internet freedom abroad on the communicators with the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, Daniel Baer. We'll have that tonight at 8 o'clock Eastern Time here on C-SPAN 2. And a couple of live events tomorrow. Live coverage of a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing on fighting deception and intimidation in federal elections. We'll have that at 10 a.m. Eastern on C-SPAN 3 and a discussion about the upcoming sequestration budget cuts to the Pentagon. That discussion's live at 1.30 tomorrow from the Brookings Institution with Senator Kelly Ayotte and others. That's also on C-SPAN 3.